Good morning. Welcome, everybody, to another CTIA incentive auction panel. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you, a uh, few of you who don't know us. Uh, <laughs> There's nobody out yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Gary Epstein. I'm chair of the Incentive Auction Task Force, and with me is Howard Simons, the vice chair of the task force, and Aaron Griffith, who is an attorney advisor in the Wireless Bureau, and who, with Mary Margaret Jackson, put together these wonderful slides that you will see today. Um, there is a panel at 3 o'clock, um, also on incentive auctions. That one is broader in scope with outside folks, um, great stakeholders, two-thirds of whom are in the audience here today. <laughs> um, I don't know, where is Grant? <laughs> Uh, and I bet you one of the questions, I, I put money on this, that we'll be talking about bitter education and bitter training, among, among other things. And so we wanted to take advantage of the fact that you folks are here and you guys are the experts, a lot of you in the audience. And so what we're doing here is a deeper dive into the procedures, public notice, the forward auction. Um, and this is also really kind of the rollout or a test bed for the forward auction auctions, webinars, and other things that we're going to be doing. So we're going to, Howard is, uh, Professor Simons is going to run through the slides, um, and we will leave time for questions. And what we want to do is take this presentation, take your input, modify it, and really make it part of the webinar that we're doing on the forward auction. So you folks are the first who will uh, see these slides. We're going to take your input. We're probably going to revise them and then make them public and put them up on the web. Uh, thanks, Gary. Uh, uh, judging from the crowd here, um, I'm sure we'll get a lot of good input on the, uh, on the slides. Um, what we wanted to do uh, this morning, uh, given the uh, nature of the crowd here, is focus in on the forward auction uh, and how it works uh, in order to give would-be bidders uh, the opportunity to, uh, uh, to get a better understanding of that. Uh, so what we want to try to cover today is pre-auction activity, determining the clearing target, the release of impairment data, and other information to forward auction bidders, uh, go into the forward auction bidding uh, procedures in both the clock and the assignment phase, and then discuss the final stage rule and the implementation of the, uh, of the spectrum reserve. Uh, uh, before we can start uh, the forward auction, in fact, before we can start the reverse auction, uh, uh, or the clock in the reverse auction, we have to determine an initial clearing target. Uh, as the chairman reinforced strongly yesterday, uh, uh, by March 29th of next year, the reverse auction bidders are going to have to commit to an initial relinquishment option. Now, the application window for reverse auction bidders will open later this year. Uh, we'll then review their applications uh, and, and come back to them and ask for that initial clearing, uh, that initial commitment. That will be their initial bid in the auction, their initial binding bid in the auction. Once we have uh, their, their uh, initial relinquishment option, uh, we will be able to uh, determine the initial clearing target. We'll use optimization, uh, probably a phrase that many of us did not use, a word that many of us did not use regularly until the last six months, and now we use all the time. Uh, using optimization techniques, we will come up with a provisional television assignment plan for every one of the spectrum clearing targets that uh, uh, we've identified <coughs> in the report and order. Uh, if there are insufficient channels for uh, some of the non-participants or insufficient UHF channels for some of the uh, uh, participants who are looking to go from U to V, and have not given us a, uh, a backup that we can accommodate, uh, those are the stations that could be placed in the wireless band, uh, the so-called impairments. Uh, we are going to optimize uh, to minimize impairments. Uh, we have a cap uh, on overall national aggregate impairments. Uh, and as you know from the simulations that we released prior to the adoption of the procedures public notice, uh, the incidence, we believe the incidence of impairments will be very small, uh, limited to uh, a, a relatively few markets, uh, and, uh, and not disturb the overall allocation of what will be vastly predominantly uh, category one licenses with impairments of 15% of, of, of POPs 
or less, and we'll get to that uh, in a couple of slides from now. Um, the system, having run through the feasible uh, 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 clearing tar, uh, the, the feasible band pans for each clearing target, will then select the highest possible clearing target that satisfies the impairment cap. And that will be our starting point. Uh, from that, we'll be able to identify the 600 megahertz band plan that we're we'll go going to be running the auction toward and the provisional channel assignment plan uh, for, uh, uh, for TV stations. Looking for the arrow here. There we go. I say that. I'll use this one. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, just a quick refresher. Uh, this is the one block equivalent, one weighted pop uh, block equivalent uh, impairment cap that, that the Commission adopted uh, in the August 6th procedures public notice. Uh, you can see it runs from a low of 8% uh, at the aspirational target of 144 megahertz uh, and is capped at 20% of, of weighted pops when we get to 72 megahertz uh, uh, and below. Uh, and it, and it, a, an increasing uh, uh, cap as we move down from 144. So looking at 84, uh, the uh, cap would be 14%. Uh, 126, the cap would be 10%. These are maximums. Again, uh, I think as you know from the, uh, uh, in, from the uh, simulations we released, we, we don't get actually up to that cap. Uh, and uh, in fact, what we find is that uh, uh, what happens is you get close uh, or reasonably close uh, and then you wind up dropping to another uh, clearing target. You don't wind up going all the way to 14 or all the way to 10. Uh, you wind up having to sort of leap over or below the, the cap as you move from clearing target to clearing target. Once we set the clearing target uh, and the associated ban plan, we'll announce that to the public at large, and then the reverse auction bidding rounds begin. Uh, during the reverse auction rounds, uh, because uh, once the information has been once the information about the clearing target has been communicated to forward auction bidders, uh, they will have to make upfront payments, establish their eligibility, and we will release the qualified bidder PN, uh, announcing the list of qualified forward auction bidders. This we anticipate this will be going on while the clock phase of the reverse auction is going on. Uh, and uh, that will enable forward auction bidders to uh, uh, become uh, uh, comfortable with the information. Uh, we anticipate that we'll run the mock auction, uh, mock forward auction during this period of time uh, so that forward auction bidders will have familiarity with the impairment data, they'll have familiarity with uh, a, a secured mock auction. Uh, we'll come back to bidder education and, and, and what attends that in addition to the mock auction later uh, or this afternoon. Uh, but um, uh, that will enable us to make the transition between the reverse auction and the forward auction within the five-day period that's specified in the procedures PN. So we can go right into it once the reverse auction is done and we know what the, uh, uh, the financial bogey is uh, for the uh, uh, successful, uh, uh, successful incentive auction overall. Um, we, uh, we will be giving forward auction bidders detailed information uh, about uh, impairments and the array of, uh, of uh, uh, blocks in the band before, the, before obviously, the, the forward auction starts. Uh, you will know the actual, you if, if you're a bidder, will know the actual source and location of any impairment, including facility information. You'll know which stations are causing the impairments. Uh, you will know the percentage of uh, uh, impairment by population, where the impairment is located, uh, as to band and geographically. Uh, we'll provide that information in each stage. Uh, obviously, uh, it could change if there's more than one stage, uh, and impairment data will not be finally fixed until the final stage rule is satisfied. But that information will be in hand for forward auction bidders uh, before they have to make their upfront payments, and they'll have the information to work with uh, while, the, uh, uh, while they're uh, engaged in bidding in the, uh, uh, in the forward auction. This, this detailed information, including uh, ID of the stations causing the impairments, is not public. It will only be available to, uh, uh, to forward auction bidders. Uh, the reverse auction ends. You've got your information. You've made your upfront payments. Now the forward auction bidding uh, begins. As, as you probably all know here, it's going to be in two phases. An ascending clock phase, uh, which will determine the winners of generic blocks. 
and an assignment phase that will determine the assignment of specific frequency licenses to winners of generic blocks. Uh, in the ascending clock phase, bidders will indicate the number of blocks they want at a per block price, uh, and uh, uh, that will be, uh, there will be an announced price at the beginning of each round. Uh, you will indicate how many units, uh, uh, what quantity you want at that price. And unlike a traditional SMR auction, we won't have provisional winners, only that a bidder is in the auction uh, at each specified price. Our auction system will calculate total demand uh, and uh, whether, there's, uh, whether demand exceeds, equals, or is less than supply is, is obviously a critical factor as we go from round to round. Uh, if bidders demand more, uh, if, if demand exceeds supply, the clock price will tick up uh, and you'll be asked, uh, a bidder will be asked how many blocks they demand at the next price. Uh, the winners of the auction will be bidders who are still demanding blocks when demand does not, no longer exceeds supply. Um, there'll be two categories of generic blocks, as I'm sure you have all committed to memory by now. Uh, category one will be blocks that have zero to 15% impaired pops. Category two will be uh, generic blocks with uh, more than 15, up to 50% impaired pops. And uh, we will not be selling uh, any of the blocks that have uh, more than 50% pops impaired. Those will be set aside for a future auction. Uh, the vast, vast majority of licenses will be category one. Uh, uh, we summarize here the staff simulations. Uh, in all of our simulations, at least 93 plus percent of all licenses were uh, uh, category one, and in the top 40 PEAs, between 88 and 93 percent of licenses were uh, category one licenses. So uh, impairments are uh, a necessity in an auction where we don't know the supply in advance. Uh, as I think all of you know, and I, indeed I think all of you would acknowledge. Uh, what we've tried to do is uh, devise a system here uh, where the impairments are minimized and manageable and the vast amount of the portfolio that's going to be available for bidding will be category one. Three, there will be three bid types in the ascending clock uh, auction. Simple bids, uh, where bidders indicate a desired quantity at a price. Uh, we will process those bids in full or in part. Uh, second, all or nothing bids, where you also, uh, uh, you also uh, indicate a desired quantity at price. But these bids, unlike a simple bid, will either be processed fully or not at all. And finally, switch bids, uh, where a bidder in a round can move from one category to another uh, within a P. You can go from category one to category two, or category two to category one. Uh, a bid to reduce demand will be treated as a request, and it will only be fulfilled if total demand is at least equal to supply in a PEA. We won't let demand drop, aggregate demand drop below uh, 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 supply in a PEA. Uh, you'll also be given, a bidders will also be given the option of indicating intra-round prices uh, in order to uh, uh, provide greater flexibility in bidding. Uh, and that in turn allows us to have large bidding increments uh, and speeds up the auction, uh, but not overshoot the market clearing price. Uh, uh, in this way, this is one of the ways that the, uh, uh, the forward auction differs from the reverse auction where we will not have intra-round bidding. Uh, in order to determine whether a stage is the final stage, we've adopted the cleverly named final stage rule. Uh, uh, the final stage rule has two components. I feel like I could ask somebody in the audience to recite these back to us at this point, but uh, I'll, I'll do it uh, for now. Uh, there are two components. One is the price benchmark, uh, and the second is the, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one is the, uh, uh, the first component is uh, make sure that the, uh, the prices uh, that we're getting in the forward auction are competitive. That has two components, a price and a spectrum benchmark component. Uh, for clearing targets uh, at 84 and below, that, tar that, uh, the, that target is satisfied if the uh, average bid price in the top 40 PEAs is a dollar and a quarter per megahertz pop. Uh, for targets above 84, the embarrass Gary's embarrassment of riches outcome, uh, the, uh, this component is satisfied if the gross amount 
uh, that we're getting is equal to the product of a dollar and a quarter per megahertz pop uh, times uh, uh, 70 megahertz sold. So it's about 16, I think 16, 17 billion dollars. Uh, and that way we're not tied to a dollar and a quarter. We recognize that at higher clearing targets, there's a possibility that the, the price may not be a dollar and a quarter, but it gives us a, a, a benchmark overall to shoot for uh, in order to make sure that this, this auction produces competitive pricing uh, and we can meet our objective of, of uh, returning a portion of the uh, uh, proceeds to the public. Uh, the second component uh, is the cost component. Uh, that makes sure that uh, the money we're getting in is enough to meet our costs. Uh, first and, and largest component of that is the cost of, broad, of clearing uh, the broadcasters. Second is the $1.75 billion TV broadcaster relocation fund. And the third is our administrative costs. Uh, this auction is also unique uh, uh, because it has an extended round. If we come close uh, when supply and demand uh, meet, and we're not quite at the final stage rule, but we're close, uh, our auction system provides for an extended round. It gives bidders the opportunity to express demand at higher prices to meet the final stage rule at the, this particular stage rather than the stage failing uh, and dropping to another stage where there's less supply. So it gives bidders the opportunity to secure the amount of supply at a higher stage if they're willing to meet the, the, uh, the delta between the last regular round uh, and what we need to satisfy the final stage rule. Now we do have a, a collar around that. Uh, the extended round will not be implemented if the gap between the uh, forward auction proceeds at the end of the regular rounds and what we need to satisfy the final stage rule exceeds 20% of auction proceeds. If, that, if the delta is bigger than 20%, we will drop to another stage and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll run the auction at that new lower stage. Uh, uh, we, uh, if we do run an extended round, we'll set an increment uh, that's 33% larger than the increment actually necessary to f satisfy the final stage rule gives bidders something to shoot for, uh, and uh, uh, we think is, a, is the fairest way to make sure that the extended round, if we do run one, uh, has a, a good chance of meeting the objective of the extended round, which is to be able to close the auction at the stage that we're currently running, rather than dropping to a, uh, another stage. By, just by way of reminder, when we meet the final stage rule, if we determine that the final stage rule has been met, that doesn't mean the bidding stops. Uh, it just means we're in the final stage rule and the bidding will continue uh, until, uh, uh, until a demand no longer exceeds supply. Uh, the final stage rule is also important because it's the trigger for the Spectrum Holdings Reserve. Uh, uh, it's the, uh, the point at which the reserve is set. Uh, again, uh, as, as this group uh, and by and large probably knows, the maximum amount of spectrum that will be in the reserve will be based on the initial clearing target. We will look at category one and category two licenses in each PEA and establish uh, the actual reserve up to the maximum uh, for each PEA. So uh, in uh, clearing targets of 84 megahertz and above, uh, the uh, maximum spectrum reserve will be 30 megahertz. Uh, but in a given PEA, if uh, there are uh, only 20 megahertz available, uh, category one plus category two, the reserve will only be 20 megahertz. If we drop to another stage, uh, the reserve will still be the reserve set at the initial stage, even if the overall spectrum declines up to the maximum of actual category one, category two blocks available in the PEA. Um, in smaller PEAs, a population of less than 500,000, uh, if we have 30 megahertz of reserve, no reserve eligible bidder will be allowed to purchase more than 20 megahertz. That's to, man, again, make sure we've maximized the competitive benefit of having a reserve. Once the clock phase is over, we move to the assignment phase. In the assignment phase, the winners of the generic blocks in the clock phase will have an opportunity to bid for specific frequencies within each relevant category. Uh, bidding will be by PEA or group of PEAs using a single round sealed bid format. Uh, the auction system uh, will assign contiguous frequencies to winners of multiple blocks uh, where possible and regardless of the bids placed. 
so that a bidder cannot, in the assignment phase, cannot strategically seek to break up contiguous blocks uh, of another winner. The auction system will provide the menu of uh, bidding options consisting of possible configurations, and then uh, the winning bidders will uh, bid from among those options uh, to uh, uh, indicate its preferences. Uh, bidding in the assignment phase is voluntary. All winners, including those who don't bid, will be assigned contiguous frequency blocks to the maximum extent feasible. Uh, what the assignment round does is give priority, and the assignment round does give priority to intra-area frequency contiguity and seek to maximize the number of bidders that are assigned at least two contiguous blocks. What the assignment round does is allow bidders who want to go beyond the contiguity that's, that's created by the auction system uh, uh, to express preferences uh, perhaps between PEAs uh, or from among the contiguous blocks that are available within a PEA. Uh, I'll stop there, uh, and first I, I ask uh, Gary and Aaron uh, if they want to add anything, and then uh, uh, turn it over to the open mic. No, um, the only, uh, thanks Howard, as usual, a terrific job. Um, the only point I want to make is the focus here is that everything that Howard described has been adopted by the commission, you know, over the last several months. The commission um, de determined that it would be a commission level procedures public notice. It was. It was um, um, adopted in, in August, and these are the basic policy decisions that have been made. And we are now down to a focus on making it work, and that's what we're really um, all about and, and want to work with you on, on achieving. Um, we got into another level of detail here. I'm sure there are about 11 levels of detail more than this, um, but the basic construct and the, and, and the basic forward auction is now set. Paul, Paul Kirby with TR Daily. Can you give us any update on the timing of three things that are still pending, the vacant channel, the inter-service -serv interference, and the commencement of operation? Items? I'd actually like to reserve those kind of questions for this afternoon. Um, you know, I don't, you know, I want to save something. <laughs> All right, let, let me ask you something then. And this came up yesterday afternoon at one of the panels, the quiet period, some of the wireless carriers. Same thing, we're going to talk about the You, you want to say that till later? Yeah, you can ask the questions. I'm, again, we're, we're trying to keep this focused on the, on the forward auction okay. and actually how those questions work. Those are all good questions, happy can, to answer them. Can I just carry this mic around all day and then follow <laughs> you as <laughs> Paul, you know how it is, Paul. It's it, this is the vegetables. The dessert is the same. <laughs> I've never been called a dessert before, but it's okay. I've been called a vegetable, though, so I think it's perfect. Well, although I'm worried that you'll you'll postpone this as well. But uh, this is on the mechanics. So March 29th, we're going to get the relinquishment options in. Presumably, you guys have run a bunch of simulations as to how long it'll take to get to the clearing target and to the actual band plan. What are you expecting that that timing may be from March 29th to actually having a band plan and a, and a clearing target? You know, uh, we're, we are working through that. I, I, it will be in fairly short order. I think it will not be days. It will, it will, be, it will probably take us some, you know, a, a small number of weeks to do that. Uh, but we want to get it done quickly because we want to move as quickly as possible to the clock. Uh, the clock rounds in the uh, in the reverse auction. Yeah, best guess is, a, is at most a couple weeks. Yeah. Uh, just two quick procedural questions. One, is there going to be any sort of interim public notice between when people file their forward auction applications and then the, I mean, there's a rather extended period between that and when you get the qualified bidders PN because the payments are deferred. Is there going to be anything in between? We, at this point, we don't anticipate anything. In, the, the period in between is, is the period in which we're going to be reviewing the applications and getting back to the applicants. So we wouldn't, I don't know if there would be anything to release. That could change, uh, but not, it's not contemplated right now. Okay. And is there any possibility that during the post-auction optimization process where you're doing the assignments, that an impairment that has been identified gets removed or reduced? Uh, we don't anticipate that now. I mean, impairments will change if we have to go to a different stage uh, because, you know, you have a different array of stations and a different band, a different band plan. Um, at this point, and I don't want to lock this in concrete, at this point, uh, what we anticipate in the final channel optimization uh, is, is really going to be, you know, the final channels on the TV band side 
uh, because we don't, in, in part because we want the bidders in the forward auction to have some certainty that the impairments they're bidding against is not a moving target. And that, you know. Yeah. Any other questions? Everybody's waiting okay, for this Steve. afternoon. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, just on the, on the, a little more on the timing. So, because the mock auction will be after the 20, after you set yes. the clearing target. Do you have a feel for how long that would be before the forward auction starts, or how much time? Well, be? what we said, at, what we said in the procedures PN is that people have at least 15 days to review impairment data before the. Uh, uh, before the forward auction starts, and, and we've said there'll be five days between the end of one, the beginning of the other. Uh, so I think, you know, assuming that, you know, we're running a reverse auction with, you know, whatever is 52 rounds, take, you know, a month-ish to do that, it'll be during that period that we would be giving the, you know, announcing the qualified bidder PN and providing the, doing the mock auction. Okay. And we haven't, you know, you'll notice in that part of the procedures PN it says at least uh, so, you know, there's a little bit of play, but we obviously don't want, for a whole range of reasons that I think you all would be fairly sympathetic with, we don't want to, we don't, you want enough, you want enough time to be able to review the data and, and make intelligent upfront payments, but you also don't want these auctions to wait and the broadcasters don't want it to wait. And as I understand the chairman yesterday, he doesn't want to wait. <laughs> so we want to move forward. Um, so the uh, staff simulations you guys previously released were helpful in that they helped elucidate where we might see impairments, but of course those simulations were against the old constraint files. So you've been very successful at the borders. I know we talked last week about, uh, we certainly asked you to consider re-releasing that data with the same participation models that you had, so we might get some sense of where uh, your tool would find impairments or the markets that are most likely to see impairments uh, under the participation models you identified. Have you done any more thinking on whether we're gonna see that type of information? Uh, we have not, it, it's, an, it's a very interesting suggestion. We have not done any more thinking. It's obviously there's a resource issue at our end. Do that and also, uh, uh, you know, the pluses and minuses as we're moving forward in, in doing another data release while we're, while we're getting ready for the auction. But yeah. certainly understand, we will be putting out Obviously, the final constraint files, the final TV baseline list, as well as the opening bid prices in the reverse auction, I, I guess around Columbus Day. Uh, the, uh, uh, and and uh, so even if we don't put out our simulations, you'll have that data uh, and you can run it and, and be able to get some sense of it. It won't be our tool, understand, but we will be putting out the raw, the data inputs that you and, and I know others in the room here who've been engaged in their own simulations will be able to run and, and, and I think get a pretty good sense of that. So you think final constraint files with the, the application will be Rough, around yeah. contemporaneously, roughly, yeah. Whether it's gonna be part of that or not, or whether it, it'll be very close in time. Questions? Anybody else? Okay. Um, I would just echo something Gary said, you don't all have to raise your hands now, but Find us or call us. I mean, I, 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 I know this, is, this, this deck is sort of the beta deck. Uh, it's not gonna be posted, but you all, I could tell we're paying very careful attention. Uh, so if you do have comments or questions or things that you think we can do better or explain better, that we will have another webinar which will be much more detail. Uh, but you know, any initial input, come find us. You know where we are and, and please let us know. Thank you guys so much. Wait, got one more? Oh. Tom. Tom. Uh, I didn't mean right now, Tom, but go ahead. <laughs> he did, he did. No, go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's just that you, you've got text here, and I think it would be helpful to flow it out. Um, just create a flow chart of this happens here, right. this happens there, that happens there. We How have, I don't, want to, I don't want to spoil it, but we've been working on an animation. <laughs> and I don't, mean like, I don't mean like Mickey Mouse, but I mean you, like the you kind personally? Like, you personally? Because I'd like no, to see Aaron that. personally. Yeah, I was going to say. Aaron personally has been working on it. We're like broadcaster, at, you know. She's working, on, she's working on it, but it will be of Howard. Yeah, so. right, exactly. <laughs> no, I, I, think there, I think both a flow, a flow chart, a static flow chart, 
But we also found, at least I found, that looking at these things, watching, you know, how you do a clearing target on a, on a kind of step-by-step -step basis is actually very helpful. And I think the same thing may be true in terms of bidding options and assignment round, that sort of thing. So yes, that is a good suggestion, and uh, we'll give you all the credit when we do it. <laughs> and if, it, if you could include, I mean, time-wise, too, it would just be so useful to see. I, I think I have all the steps and the approximate yep. times, and I know some of them you don't know. You know, you said a small number of weeks or two weeks, but if there could be sort of a period of time, roughly, that would be really helpful, too, just to keep it all in. That's a great suggestion. I mean, we have to be a little bit careful for the reason you say, but right. I think we, we, we can right. try to do at least order of magnitude so people know it's, you know, right. you right. know get, a, get a sense of, of, of the flow and when the real break points are like end of year or March 29th or whatever it turns out. Right. You know, that would later. be really helpful because yep. I've heard different, and people are beginning to make guesstimates, and I've heard different guesstimates, so it would be really helpful to hear you know, even if they are estimates, it'd be helpful. Right. No, it's a great suggestion. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Final call. Okay. One more try here. Hmm. Paul. Is your cartoon going to be done by the same people who did T-Mobile's Fabulous Five? <laughs> no, it's going to be much less interesting than that. <laughs> Stan Lee was not available, <laughs> so. Well, let's give a big hand to Gary, Howard, and Aaron. Thank you so much. And, and, and we will see you all at 3 again. Yes, please, please. We've got a great panel. Instead of auction panel at 3 o'clock on the Washington Goes Mobile stage, be there. 2 o'clock for the commissioners. Yeah. Oh, and at 2. I'm, I'm sorry, because I'm moderating that panel. I'm saying, yay, show up to that one. But before that, you got to show up at 2 for our uh, president and CEO, Meredith Atwell Baker. Uh, not here, no. On the Washington Goes Mobile stage in the Venetian Ballroom, where we had our panels yesterday afternoon. Okay, great. Thank you.